If you get online and look for zero point energy devices or gadgets or things like that, you're going to find lots and lots of claims, dozens if not hundreds of claims of devices and conspiracies and things that are on the shelf but hidden from us and so on. I don't believe any of that. What I'm presenting to you this morning is, I think, the real McCoy, the real thing. The problem is it's the real thing, but we can't guarantee it's going to work. I mean, this is something that we, we think may be revolutionary. On the other hand, we have yet to prove it experimentally. So I'll talk to you this morning about the physics behind it. This uh, concerns the quantum vacuum energy patent that Garrett Modell and I were issued a couple of years ago. It's now assigned to the University of Colorado. And it concerns zero-point energy. Now, the zero-point energy comes directly from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you let any oscillator oscillate, it will eventually come to rest because of friction. In the, the case of a quantum oscillator, it will never come to rest because the Heisenberg uncertainty principle forbids taking the last little bit of energy out of anything. So it was first proposed prior to the onset of quantum mechanics in uh, 1912 and 1913 by Max Planck, Einstein, Otto Stern, who studied this in the context of the black body emission. Now, interestingly, it uh, was sort of dropped from consideration for a number of years until quantum mechanics was developed in the 1920s, and then zero-point energy came directly out of the quantum mechanics uh, formulations of that time, and it's been part of quantum mechanics ever since. You can calculate how much zero-point energy there ought to be at any place in the universe. You do this by looking at the, the modes of the field. I don't want to get too technical, but modes of the field means any, in any given direction or frequency, there is an electromagnetic uh, mode. And if you sum all those up, you get a, a frequency-dependent spectrum that goes as frequency cubed. And so the spectrum of the zero-point energy goes as the frequency cubed, which means it rises very rapidly Unfortunately, it rises to we don't know where. It could be infinity, which is a bit embarrassing because you don't want an infinite amount of energy in the universe. It could cut off at the Planck frequency, which still is enormously large. So we, we just don't know where this cuts off, but it goes as the frequency cubed spectrum. Now, there are effects that can be attributed to zero-point energy. One of them is the Casimir force. If you put uh, two plates close together, you find that the, the wavelengths of light or of zero-point radiation, which is a form of light, um, small, that are larger than the cavity, uh, uh, the distance between the two plates in the cavity, they can't exist there because of electromagnetic boundary conditions. And so you have an underpressure. You have more waves of zero-point radiation outside of the Casimir cavity than inside that causes the plates to be pushed together. That's one way to explain the Casimir force. It's been measured. The Casimir force is now a well-established phenomenon. It's not only been measured, but it's also part of uh, microtechnology these days because the Casimir force is a candidate to use for control of microelectronic devices. It's also responsible for an annoying problem called stiction, which causes things at a very small scale to stick together. So there's no doubt that the Casimir force exists, and uh, that it's e even a potentially useful thing or a potential nuisance, depending upon how you look at it, but it's, it's certainly something that is part of modern technology. The, uh, the force between parallel plates due to the zero-point field goes as the inverse square of the, uh, or the inverse fourth power of the distance between them. That's also been measured very precisely now. Now, while I've been emphasizing the Casimir force, in fact, the Casimir force is not necessarily attributed to the zero-point field. It's possible to reformulate all this in terms of the interactions of particles in the two plates with each other, like a typical van der Waals force kind of formulation. And so the fact that the Casimir force exists, even though it seems to me to be a pretty good, pretty good more than a suggestion, but less than a proof, as zero-point energy exists, it's not a guarantee because there is this altern alternate formulation in terms of source theory. However, the quantum noise in a circuit has been measured. And in my opinion, the quantum noise in a circuit can be attributed directly to zero-point energy. And so, it, in my view, it has been measured directly as if a real phenomenon, that zero-point energy exists. Now, the measurement in the, in the circuits has been at very low frequencies. And so all we know for sure is that zero-point energy exists at very low frequencies. We would need for it to exist at fairly high frequencies to be useful in the context of this invention I'll be talking about, the, uh, the device that we hope will be able to tap into zero-point energy. Now, uh, this, uh, the, the, the objection is also raised sometimes that you can't actually extract energy from the zero-point field. It can't do anything useful. Well, there's actually a, a thought experiment that was published in 1984 already by Bob Forward that shows very clearly that, yes, you can, do, you can get work out of the zero-point field. There's no doubt about it. It's not useful in this context, but you can, get, you, you can get work out of it. We're hoping what we proposed is useful. This is not useful, but it's a, it's a demonstration of the principle. If you take this, um, 
this sort of spiral, uh, spiral plate and you charge it up with, with electricity, so it simply has positive or negative charge on it, and you then rely on the Casimir force that acts between the layers of the plates, you can use the Casimir force to press this, this uh, spiral together. And in doing so, you're increasing the electric field in the region, well, you're increasing the electric field, but because you're, you're causing the charges to get, to get closer together. And so this is very useful for demonstrating the, 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 the effect of the zero point field doing work on this device. Now the problem is it can only do work during half a cycle. If you wanted to recycle this, you'd have to pull it apart again, and let the zero point energy then push things back together. That's not very useful because it's going to take more energy to pull it apart than you get out of pushing it together. But think of this as an engine that works for one half of a cycle. Not useful, but certainly demonstrates that zero point energy is doing work. It actually does work here. And that's the useful aspect of this. So this was the Robert Forward ba uh, battery experiment proposed in the uh, mid-1980s. Now, uh, the basis of our experiment, or our patent, is the uh, prediction of, from theoretical physics that the ground state of hydrogen might be attributed to the, the zero-point energy. Now, we all know that um, the classical view of an atom that was developed in 1913 to try to explain the, the early results of uh, well, atomic physics uh, showed that there was a problem in the Rutherford view of the atom, which was having the electron orbit around the nucleus, just like a planet around the sun. The problem with that, of course, is that as an electron goes around the, the nucleus, it radiates energy, a lot more radiation. And it would quickly spiral into the nucleus, and boom, that's the end of the atom in less than a millionth of a second. So clearly that model is wrong. But what's been discovered since then, in the, in the 1970s and 80s, was that if you let an electron spiral around the nucleus, just the way a planet would around the sun, yes, it will emit lot more radiation, but if you let it pick up energy from the zero-point field, you find, interestingly, that there's a balance between those two effects exactly at the Bohr radius. So this strongly suggests that the Bohr radius is not there because Bohr said you are not allowed to decay. Rather, at that point, there's a balance between the amount of energy that a radiating electron will naturally emit as it orbits around the nucleus versus what it would pick up from the zero-point field. And so we're kind of back to a classical view of an electron as, as something that is sort of real that's going around a nucleus that is, ex that is stabilized in its orbit by zero-point energy. Now, I don't want to take that too literally because I'm, I'm not really very happy with the thought of going to a 100-year-old model of the electron going around the nucleus. But the point is that zero-point energy, uh, zero energy contribution to the stability of whatever this orbit is exactly balances the emission that you would expect if this were a classically orbiting electron. So there you have a, a schematic of it. The, the stable orbit in quantum theory is provided by simply the, the Bohr condition that you're not allowed to radiate, whereas in our case, the, the interpretation is one of, of a balance between two things, radiation and emission, and of em, radiation of emission and absorption of emission from the zero point field. So um, in quantum electrodynamics, you, all, you have a prediction of zero point energy, but it's regarded as virtual. And electron energy states are determined by the wave function. So what you see down here at the bottom is the, uh, the, uh, the classical, I must say classical, sort of classical quantum uh, probability density distribution of the electron orbital as a function of distance from the nucleus. Now, as it turns out, you can go a step further than the, the, the previous Hal Putoff analysis that I showed, which indicates that at the Bohr radius, there's a balance between the emission and absorption of radiation. You can actually go to simulations that show that if you let an electron so it would be buffeted around the, as it be buffeted by the zero point fluctuations as it orbits around the nucleus in a Coulomb field, that in fact, this probability distribution, which is attributed usually simply to the, uh, the wave function of the electron, can be reproduced by letting the, the model of the zero point field buffeting the electron uh, take place. And so, here's a simulation run by Dan Cole at Boston University. He took a classical electron, let it orbit in a, in a Coulomb field, let it be buffeted by the zero point fluctuations, and look at the position as a function of time of that electron, and lo and behold, it looks just like the, the probability density function that you get from quantum mechanics. And so it looks as if this model, this sort of simplistic model of an orbiting electron, does a pretty good job of giving you the, the, the same important condition that you find from quantum mechanics. Um, I'm going to close a close-up of the same thing. The, the quantum probability density function for the ground state of hydrogen is a solid line, and the, uh, the simulations using the, the, the buffeting of the zero-point field on the electron is the, uh, the dashed line. This is also um, reproduced by um, 
uh, uh, L.J. Nickish at uh, an institute in Monterey, who did the same thing, but with his own with his own different uh, with his own simulation program, different from Dan Cole's. So, what is the the basis for our uh, for our patent? Well, an SCD, electron orbits are determined by this balance of emission and absorption. And so, if you take a you take an electron, an atom, I should say, and put it into a Casimir cavity, what you see here in the middle, what you see here in the middle is the long wavelength radiation uh, schematically represented by everything in green, and shorter wavelength radiation from the zero point field represented by everything in purple. And when the, uh, the, the atom is sitting out in free space, of course, it sees the entire zero point radiation field. When we insert it into a cavity, that cavity then blocks out the longer wavelength uh, aspects of the zero point field. And so it's only reacting to the, the, the truncated zero point field, which is represented by the, the, the purple arrows. And so since there's less zero point energy pumping up the electron in its orbital, we would assume that the electron would spiral inward slightly, and, and as it does so, give off some energy, which energy then we would propose to capture. And so this is the basic idea behind the patent. So the idea is that if you have an atom, and let's uh, have it moving from, uh, uh, from left to right through the system, in free space, the, uh, you might have an atom that has a number of electrons. In, in particular, probably we would use uh, noble gases, uh, argon, neon, xenon, or krypton, because they have a, a number of outer shell electrons that can be acted upon by this effect. In free space, you have the, uh, several electrons in the the orbitals you'd expect. When the atom enters a Casimir cavity, so you have plates here, the orange, are, uh, the orange uh, lines represent plates, you would then expect some emission of radiation from the atom because the orbit has shrunk a little bit. Then the, uh, elect the atom moves out of the region between the, the plates into free space again, so this gray represents no Casimir plates. It's again pumped up by the zero point field, goes back into its normal orbit goes through another Casimir cavity, and so on. So you can have this take place many times. In fact, in our, one of our uh, prototypes or prototype concepts, hundreds of times, the atom would move through in and out, in and out, in and out of Casimir cavities, and each time it does so, it would emit some radiation that we would hope to capture. So where's that energy coming from? Well, in fact, the energy is always picked up when the uh, atom leaves the Casimir cavity. It's being picked up from the universe at large. We're, we're drawing energy out of the zero point field of the universe. It's sort of like taking a thimble and taking water out of the ocean. Yeah, we're, we're, using, we're getting energy at the expense of something, but it's something enormous, something vast. It's something that permeates the entire universe everywhere. And so the view is that we are able to tap into this universal sea of zero-point energy using this device. And down at the bottom, we simply have a, a, a schematic representation of a heat exchanger. We don't know exactly where the, where, where the radiation is going to come out and how to capture it. That's part of the, part of the problem we face now in trying to show experimentally that this is going to work. <coughs> 